Welcome to Salt Mine Apologetics, where we are digging for the evidence, seasoned with salt, so that we can have a defense for our hope in Christ Jesus. I am your fellow miner, Courtney Guthrie, and today we're going to be talking about Bauer's thesis of multiple Christianities. But before we get to that, let's do a quick review of what we've looked at in the past. First, I talked about special revelation and how we received it from God in the form of our Bible, which gives us direct communication from God about how we are redeemed and how we can be reunited to him after the fall. Uh, the second thing I talked about were how we as a church recognize the original writings as original manuscripts to be from God and therefore have his inerrancy, have his authority, and have his authenticity to them. Uh, the next thing I talked about was the definition of canon, and I gave us a little bit of a confusion moment where we were trying to decide what we think of as canon and what we think of as scripture uh, so that we could kind of refute that fourth or fifth century dating that they suddenly appeared from a room full of men in a back church room over cigars with this plethora of writings. Um, and then I talked about how I, we have a reasonable case that we can make from the evidence that the authors of the New Testament, that they were correctly attributed, that the men who are said to have written them were the very men who wrote them, minus maybe a couple of the books. So having that, today what we're going to be talking about is Bauer's thesis. So who is Bauer? Now, in the first class, I talked about a man named Thomas Munzer, another German theologian. But in this case, uh, Bauer, Walter Bauer, is a German theologian, and he was in the 1930s when he wrote this book called Orthodoxy and Heresy in the Earliest Church. And in the 1970s, it was translated to English, and people in here in America who had really started to take uh, an invested time in the Gnostic writings started to attribute this theology that Christianity had multiple Christianities at that time, um, and really run with it, being bantered about a lot of theological commitments that were happening. Uh, so we're not talking about diverse in race or that sort of thing. We're talking about what God wanted from us, what Jesus' pur purpose here was, and how we receive our redemption. He's saying that that was very diverse in the early stages of the church. As a matter of fact, he's saying that they didn't even really care about having a canon at all. So, is it true? And how do we know that all those other nasty little documents out there that support being gospels of certain people, how do we know that they shouldn't be in our Bible? That they, with their incorrect theology, weren't excluded just because we had dominant people? That's what we're fighting for today. So, get to our scripture. I've given you this verse several times. You're going to start to memorize it at some point. 2 Peter 3.15, last time I brought it up in the last class, I pointed out that he's talking about the words of Paul being on par with Old Testament scripture. And that's very important. But what also is showing here is that the idea of scripture was taking place in that first century by apostles. So clearly he was supporting this idea of scripture within the church from an early, early time. So that's starting to give some credence to what we're going to be fighting for today. So in order to do this, I felt the best way to attack this was to attack when these things were written. So we're going to get into dating today. So the important dates that we should start with is Jesus' death and the time that the Jews were expelled from Rome. So we're not absolutely certain of when Jesus died, believe it or not. It was somewhere between 30 to 33 AD. But we are certain of when the Jews were expelled from Rome, and that was 49 AD. Now these facts, because we don't have the original manuscripts, are part of what goes into the dating of the writings of the New Testament. Right? We don't have the originals anymore. Which I'm kind of in line with some other theologians who say that this is probably a good thing, because we are idol makers. We love to turn things into religious things we can bow down to. And I guarantee if we had the original manuscripts, we would be bowing down to them. 
at least some churches would be. So we're going to start with Paul. Paul wrote Galatians. Now, Paul began his missionary journeys around 46 to 47 AD, and in Galatians 2, 1 through 10, he mentions his visit to Jerusalem. So it's generally believed that this visit corresponds with the Jerusalem Council that you see mentioned in Acts 15. So according to Acts 15, this council took place around 49 to 50 AD. So this places the writing somewhere right around that time. So if it happened in 49, it probably had him writing it right after that, somewhere in 40, 49, 49 to 50. That's how that dating came about. Thessalonians, it's believed that he visited Thessalonica during his second missionary journey, which occurred during 49 to 50 AD. And the letters were probably written right after his visit. So that makes his, this dating for the Thessalonians to be 50 to 51. Uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16, 5 through 7, he discusses his desire to visit Corinth. He actually wants to visit in the winter. So this suggests that it was written before the winter, right? And that aligns with that 55 to 56 AD timing. Romans, Romans 16, 1 through 2, he mentions Phoebe, the deaconess. Um, he implies that the letter was written from Corinth because she would have taken it from Corinth to the Rome church, the Roman church. And Romans 15, 22 to 29, he outlines, he outlines his travel plans. He wants to visit Rome um, after he completes his work. This suggests the writing to the Romans anticipated this visit, which would have put it around 57 AD. But then... And did I do all of them? Yes, I did all of them. James and Mark. I don't have a whole lot of evidence to give you about James. So I'm just giving you the dates that the scholars, and now I could give you some of their evidence, but it gets thick. It gets really thick. It's not as, quite as straightforward as the other ones. But the dating that most scholars give it is 40s to 60s. That's a general estimate, and I, I think you can see that's a pretty wide time frame, but it is generally accepted. So you can see we're still in the mid-first century. Mark, however, Mark 13, prophesies about the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. There's a future tense verb here. There's an accusation being made that he wrote it after, and we're trying to imply that he prophesied about it, but the verb usage he uses is a future tense verb. So it was prophesied about that destruction didn't happen until 70 AD. He also mentions that um, he was in Rome with Peter. So this places it around that time that Peter was there, and that would be the late 50s to early 60s. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Were the apostles around Jerusalem after no, that, or just? The written, the, the, um, they all the, not exactly. I can't like rattle off the dates of their their deaths, but I know that that's coming up um, yeah, in general. If anyone knows the dates off the top of their head, I know I'm going to kind of give me a minute and let's see if I get to it because I. A cutoff point for, for the, uh, the gospel. Oh, yes. Well, we're going to get to the end and, and you'll see exactly when the last one could have possibly been written. Um, you'll see which ones come last. Uh, so, Philemon. In Philemon 10 and 11. Paul mentions Onesimus had become a son to him while he was in prison. So it seems to have been written while Paul was imprisoned with him. And he was imprisoned, often dated to the time of 60 to 62 AD. So this puts this about then. Um, Colossians, there's a Colossians connection here between Colossians and Ephesians. I'm going to explain that in a second. But that puts their dating very similarly. If you date one one time, you've got to date the other one around the same time. I'll explain why. 
And Colossians 4, 10 through 18, he mentions several individuals, including, uh, including Onesimus and Aristarchus, and both of them were called fellow prisoners. So again, it had to have been written during that time that they were all in prison. Uh, the, the connection is that he also mentions Tychicus in, in Ephesians 6, 21 and in Colossians 4, and that's the person who's going to bear the letter. So he's the letter bearer. And so he took both letters at the same time to those two different places on his journey. So that's why they're, that's the connection that's between those two. I know I'm flying. Uh, Luke, Luke ends with Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Again, that dating 60 to 62 AD. He had to write Acts after that because he actually says in Acts that there was a book preceding this one. That would be his first book. But um, if he wrote it after Acts, and we know when he wrote Acts, then it had to be around 57 to 62 AD. So that's how you're getting this from dating Acts, and I'll get to the Acts part now. Um, Acts ends with the depiction of Paul's two-year um, imprisonment in Rome, again, 60 to 62 AD. And this conclu concludes the book with Paul preaching, and he's unhindered at this point. It doesn't mention anything significant that happens after that time period, like the martyrdom of Peter and Paul. It doesn't mention the destruction of the temple. It doesn't mention any of the major de developments that happen later on. And it is very unlikely that Luke would have failed to mention these major catastrophic events in his book had they occurred when he wrote it. So that's a big reason why it's dated to when it is. And again, once they dated that, then they go back to what his first book was because it tells you that there is a book preceding it that had to come before it, okay? So, the, back to Paul. Philippians, uh, throughout the letter of Philippians, and Paul makes reference to his imprisonment. Uh, so uh, this particular imprisonment happened between 61 to 62. And that was in Rome, and so that's why that's dated then. 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 15, he writes that he hopes to visit Timothy and Ephesus, but he might be delayed. So he thinks he's going to be let out. He thinks he's going to have the freedom to move at this time. So that gives us a dating of when that happened. Then Titus 3, 12 through 13, he mentions his plan to visit either Artemis or Tetricus in two Titus in Crete. And um, this indicates that he had the freedom, again, to make these plans. He was still thinking that he would be available to, to leave prison and go and see these people. But then in 2 Timothy, he writes out that he is about to be poured out as a drink offering. So something has now changed, which puts this slightly later in the dating, and it suggests that it was near the end of his life. So that, my friend, is when you can date his writing. His writing couldn't come after this time period. Um, let's get to Peter. First Peter advises Christians to respect and submit to the authorities. It suggests that there was some kind of upheaval going on. The mid-60s marked... Uh, a period of increasing persecution against the Christians in the Roman Empire, uh, particularly under Nero, and that aligns really well with what was going on in Peter's letter. So that's why that gets that dating. And Second Peter, he says, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus has made clear to me. So he sees his impending martyrdom about to happen. So that dates this to the mid to late 60s. Again, nothing could be written after he was killed. So if you get a Gospel of Peter, it's probably a lie if it's dated to the second century. <laughs> okay? All right. And we're going to get to it's probably a lie for other reasons, but we'll get to that. Matthew. I got a little star by Matthew because we all have Matthew at the beginning of the Gospels in our Bible, and yet we've just now gotten to him as far as dating. And you see I've given it a very wide dating range. And some people have even tried to go even farther out, and some people have tried to get it closer in. It's just, it's based on things like linguistic comp composition and some of the theological content that was being 
written and they just don't have a very firm dating for him. But we know it was within that time period about. So forgive me that I can't give you a lot of information on that one. Hebrews, in Hebrews 13, uh, we're mentioning Timothy, and it's suggesting that Timothy was um, recently released from imprisonment. So that shows that time period of the 60s. Uh, Jude, another wide time frame, sorry. Uh, but this one's based because they think it had something to do with the content in Second Peter. And so they feel like it had to have been written after Second Peter was written. So that's where some of that dating comes from. Again, that's presupposing that these guys would find it necessary to talk to each other and get stories straight and, and make sure that their writing reflects what the other guy is writing. I don't adhere to that presupposition because my presupposition is that the Holy Spirit inspired them to write what they needed to write. However, I don't think it's beyond them to have read it, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. John comes last. John's writing is much later. Um, there are some scholars who are out there debating this down to the 60s, so as far as his gospel goes. So... It seems that he's aware, again, presupposing that he was basing his writing on this, but it seems he's aware of the Synoptic Gospels. So with that in mind, he wanted to give something that was a different perspective, maybe address some theological things that weren't addressed, that he felt weren't addressed in the uh, Synoptic Gospels. So that's why it gets this later dating. And that alone, really, kind of. Kind of a big stretch, but go with it. John's letters seem to have come after that. Um, it, that's based on church fathers and what they were saying. Like, see, they seem to be saying that the gospel came first and then he wrote these letters. And it matches with what the letters show because the letters are talking about the heretical elements that are starting to develop, and that didn't develop until the end of the first century and the beginning of the second century but specifically towards that end. And that kind of makes sense. Everything moves towards entropy, right? So you've got this idea that Jesus presents to people, this is how you're saved. And then people start to take off and try to incorporate their own Jesus instead of sticking to what he taught. So these heretical elements from outside the church were starting to breed and create content and then in these letters, he's directly addressing some of that. So if you read the letters of John, you'll see he's directly talking about that. We're saying John is very old. Time. Yeah, he, he wrote late in life, much later in life. And then Revelation he wrote when he was exiled. So here he's mentioning those seven churches in Asia Minor, suggesting that he wrote it specifically to address these communities, these churches, um, and the, what was going on kind of at that time. Um, there was intense persecution going on in Rome about that same time, so that reflects kind of what's talked about in Revelation. Again, there's some presuppositions being made here. You have to make your choice as to whether you agree with the presuppositions that are being used to date this. But with that said, it's not a lie. It, this does reflect what was going on. So you could say that the Lord used what was going on at that time to those people to help weigh upon John's heart and influence him and take him to the Lord so that the Holy Spirit would inspire him to write the book of Revelation. But it's very clear he felt like it was a gift given to him. that put him on the island, yeah. oh, he was persecuted just like the other ones. They actually had tried to, from what I understand, they had tried to burn him with oil first, and he did not die. And so then they excommunicated him, put him on the island, or whatever you call it, exiled him. Thank you. So um, I'm not absolutely certain, but that's what I've heard. From the Romans. A lot of the Romans, a lot of that anti-Christian stuff going on. I think probably there was some Jewish involvement 
because they did seem to be involved, especially with the Jesus thing. But, um, <laughs> but it was mostly Romans because of, because of the Jewish uprising and the fact that they had been sent out of Jerusalem. I did, I'm not exactly sure, but I do know it was coming from the Roman Empire. They had been pushed out of Rome, yeah. Back at that previous dating in the 49 AD. All the Romans against all the Jews, yes, and Christians, mostly Christians at this point. But Jews were kind of caught up into that because they were still Jewish, right? I mean, Jesus was Jewish. That's, that's not really, I had somebody ask me that. Do you think Jesus was Jewish? Such an odd question. <laughs> I, I actually didn't know how to answer it at first. I was like, I, yeah, yes? <laughs> um, okay, so back to Second Peter. I know y'all are going to probably go, like, why does she keep going back to this? But this is a really cool quote, because when you think about it, it's saying a lot more than even what I've already pointed out. He's reading Paul's writings. He's talking about Paul's writings, so he must have read them. And I've already given you in the last class quotes where they were saying, read these letters to the other churches. It is by command that you do this and share this information. And he's calling them scriptures, but it's showing that he had a familiarity, not just with that writing that he was addressing, but all of Paul's writings. So it's not like this was happening in a vacuum where people were writing stuff and they had no idea. Gosh, I had no idea that's what Paul was preaching over there. They did. They knew. They were aware of each other. They were paying attention to each other. And they read each other's writings. Again, another quote I've given to you in another class, 1 Timothy 5.18, written by Paul. Did I go the wrong way? I did. Oh, Timothy. There we go. Bring up Timothy. Timothy is written by Paul. And he's talking about Luke in the Old Testament, right? This is the one I talked about where he's putting what Luke wrote on the level of the Old Testament. But again, it's showing. What is it showing? It's showing that he read it. He was familiar with it. He and Luke were hanging. So obviously, this wasn't something that he was unfamiliar with. It wasn't something that the church was unfamiliar with. It was something that was being spread. It was something that was being accepted. It was something that was being read preached, taught, learned from. So having said that, I'm going to introduce some new names to some of you. These are patristic writings and the writers and their dates of when they were living and dying. But most important, I'm going to point out the middle section there because we're going to talk about these three guys in this particular class. But I wanted to give you the overall feel because I've talked about many of these patristic people in the past and I would love it if we read more of their writings. Um, but today we're going to focus on those three in the middle, Justin, who we call Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, um, and Clement of Alexandria. All three of them are going to be addressed in this particular class. And I know I've got to go fast, 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 fast. All right, so the witness of Arrhenius. Um, there was a quasi-consensus that has been building in academia that canon first regarded as scripture at the end of the second century. So where did this flawed idea come from? This is kind of what brought up that, that Bauer uh, thesis that he made, that since they didn't have any canon, since they didn't have any scripture, or that anything they considered to be scripture, and they weren't even interested in it. This meant there were tons of ideas, tons of writings coming around, and they just didn't really care. They didn't care about having writing. Now, I've already given you a pretty strong apologetic for them wanting and expecting writing, and wanting and expecting an answer to the end of the Old Testament. But I want to talk specifically about the Big Bang Theory. This Big Bang Theory is that this figure, this major figure of our religious circles, Arrhenius, who was the Bishop of Lyons, who was, I guess, very charismatic, but a very strong, strongly worded man at the very least, maybe winsome. Um, <laughs> he felt the four Gospels were so certain that their existence is entrenched in the very structure of crea creation. He said, it is not possible 
that the Gospels can be either more or fewer than the number that they are. The number of Gospels are decided and written by God. Now, was he the very first person who had ever introduced this idea that there were only four Gospels? That's the question. That's what it comes down to. So this confident language has caused scholars today to say, yeah, see, he was an innovator. He was a zealot. He was an innovator. He made people believe that all of a sudden mm -hmm. they had to adhere to this four-gospel four idea. But Dr. Kruger, who I based a lot of this class on, has a very different idea. He mentioned something that I've already talked about, specifically when I talked about the canon thing and how confusing it is, because we have people today that are telling you that canon was not established, established by the church until the 4th or 5th century. But we don't recognize it that way, right? We recognize that canon was received by the church when God gave it to us. So very different approach. But more than that, he brings up other historical sources that show that while the boundaries of the canon were a little fluid, while there are a couple of books that we still debate about, right? Most of the books that we have were viewed as scripture long before 200 AD, long before that time. So let's look at some sources that back this theory up. The Moratorium Fragment. Remember I said if it's important, I'm going to say it and say it. I'm going to say it and say it and say it. It's a Moratorium Fragment. Hopefully by the time we finish this class, y'all will all be like, I so know the Moratorium Fragment. Um, <laughs> it's that fragment that was written in the second century. This fragment, I've told you about the Shepherd of Hermas. I've told you about the three things that it lists that make us know and define scripture um, according to those ch church fathers. This has a canonical list that affirms approximately 22 of the 27 books of the New Testament. So this is written just after mid-2nd century, separate from Arrhenius, and it's already affirming 22 out of 27 of the books. So this is a significant piece of evidence that supports that this didn't just come from one dude. This was being held by contemporaries. Uh, then we have Clement of Alexandria. I'm also going to talk about Theophilus, but Clement of Alexandria, I mentioned from that patristic writings. Also late 2nd century, also a contemporary of that time. He has a very similar opinion. He says there are four Gospels. He also understands the, that there were 13 epistles from Paul, Hebrews, Acts, 1 Peter, 1 and 2 John, Jude, and Revelation, and he sees all of those as scripture. So then there's Theophilus. He wants to present Christianity, and he, as presenting them, mentions the New Testament writings as being as authoritative as the Old Testament. And Theophilus also is a source that just here in the second century, we already have people outside of Arrhenius that are confirming that the, the Gospels are our New Testament Gospels, and that's it. And these other books were part of our New Testament, and that they were on the level of Scripture. But what about before him? Maybe he sprouted this idea. But Justin, who we call Justin Martyr, who was before that time, he described a typical Christianity worship service. Yeah. And I think this is fascinating. Let me make sure. He, um, he records that Christians in the area all gathered on Sunday. He says someone would read from the Gospels <laughs> during the service and the Old Testament for as long as time would permit. And then afterward, the leader of the assembly would give them some verbal instructions and then he would say, you know, this is the church service, right? This is what it's going to be like. And it sounds remarkably similar to what you just experienced before this class. So in almost 2,000 years, our church service hasn't changed a lot. I find that fascinating. I find the fact that he's recording that they had moved it to Sunday fascinating. This is actually a good testament 
to what was going on with that early church and what they believed. They believed, with reasons, that Jesus Christ had been crucified, had been buried, and had raised up from the dead and ascended into heaven. When did that happen? What day of the week? Sunday. But the Jews were not worshiping on Sunday. What day were they worshiping on? Saturday. Amen. So Jews were shifting their day of worship for a reason. Jesus. So he refers to plural gospels, not just one, plural gospels. And he says that it was drawn up by his apostles, apostles, and those who follow them. So this language indicates that there had to have been at least two Gospels that were written by apostles, and at least two Gospels that were written by apostolic companions. Or Gospels. But not just that, he actually refers to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the memoirs of the apostles, giving them all apostolic origins and eyewitness credibility. And that's before Arrhenius. So, I had on two, two slides prior to, the, prior to this, I had mentioned Pepius. He was a bishop of Heropolis, and he uh, talked about the New Testament writers. But what's fascinating is he was writing around 125 AD, but he was writing about a time prior to that. He was writing about a time around 90 AD. And he talks about this receiving receiving of information from the elder. The elder is no doubt John. John who wrote the Gospel of John, John's epistles, and Revelation. So his connection to John gives him a very unique perspective on that connection of who wrote the Gospels, the authorship, right? So he's saying he received it directly from John. And he also talks about that the early church had received Matthew and Mark, and valued their apostolic value, status. And uh, he actually even affirms that Mark uh, received his information from Peter himself. So this source is giving us a lot of information about what the early church understood and what he himself experienced. Uh, he also knew about 1 Peter, 1 John, Revelation, and some of the Pauline letters. So He's giving us some credibility to a lot of the books in the New Testament. Um, so he kind of matched up with Arrhenius before Arrhenius. So, wow, I did go fast. Yes. All right. <laughs> there are other writings that support this, that show us that this didn't just pop into being. This wasn't a creation from one man. This is something that evolved. It was a little more nuanced than that, right? Um, there's solid evidence that the, these New Testament books were being used as scripture long before Arrhenius, uh, from a very early time period. Uh, according to Second Peter, it was at the first century. Um, and despite the fact that we didn't have clear boundaries about what canon was, that fourth or fifth century dating, it is very clear that the core of canon was present nearly from the very beginning. So we can say, look, we were going to have these disagreements about these handful of books. But even if you were to throw all those books out, we get our perfect theological content from those other books that are not being disputed. And those books are not being disputed from early, early church. They were being accepted from early church. So this wasn't a literary free-for-all. This was something that had been accepted and received long before Arrhenius. Um, and the theological content, as I mentioned, was on its trajectory from that very first century, from the time that Jesus had preached and they had recorded it. So, AEIOU, which I gave you a few classes ago, we've covered authorship. Today we covered early dating, so that's your E. We covered integrity of text, because I talked about how they had received it and recognized it as scripture from the beginning and treated it as such. And then we talked about outside cooperation. I give you a lot of outside cooperation today. So you've got some A, E, I, and O today. So excellent. Those of you at home that stayed this long, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you will like and subscribe and join us again next week. Those of you who are here, thank you so much for coming to the class. Y'all are 
Go have a great week. <laughs>